Okay, welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker, Dr. Madeline Lancaster. The Madeline is currently MRC investigator at Cell Biology Division at the MRC lab at Cambridge in UK. So she received a bachelor degree at Occidental College at LA and PhD at UC San Diego. And she moved to Austria to, uh, to her postdoc research with the Dr. Eugene Novovich. During a postdoc training, I think she opened a new field called the human brain organoid. So most of you know that uh, she published a nature paper that described the 3D structure of the human cerebral organoid from the, uh, the human pluripotent stem cell. That actually revol revolutionized the field. And after a few years of work uh, with uh, uh, Noble Beach, uh, from 2015, she started her own lab at MIC lab at Cambridge. Her independent research also made a huge contribution to the brain organoid field, particularly she devised methods called the air liquid interface to improve the quality of the organoid. She also uh, reported the generation of choroid plexus organoid. She also applied that to the COVID uh, the infection. And, and right now, her lab is focusing on the brain evolution study using cerebral organoid. I think she will present some of the work today. From her amazing work on brain organoid, Madeline received numerous awards, including one of the most pre prestigious award from ISCL, Dr. Sujan Lim Award for Outstanding Young Investigator. So without further ado, let's welcome Madeline. Thank you, thank you so much, Inhun. Um, it's really a pleasure to at least virtually be here to present uh, some of my lab's work to you today. Um, let me just make sure this goes, yeah. Okay, so, um, so my lab is interested in gaining uh, a mechanistic understanding for what makes the human brain uniquely capable of such you know, advanced cognitive capabilities that we have. And so in particular, we're focusing on developmental events that give rise to this hugely complex structure. And so probably the most striking difference between our brain and that of other related mammals is its greatly enlarged size. So our brains are over, overall around three times larger than um, those of our closest living relatives, the other great apes like the gorilla here. And when you take into account body size, then the difference becomes even more striking. And so uh, that's what this encephalization quotient is showing you here. So without going into detail of sort of how this is calculated, basically what this number means is that our brains are about seven times larger than would be expected for our body size. And other apes have uh, actually also have larger than expected brains. Uh, so you can see the gorilla here is over one, but not nearly as expanded um, compared with ours. And then as you can see in mice actually, um, mice actually have a smaller brain than would be expected for their um, body size according to the sort of general scaling rule that you see in mammals. And so of course our brain size is, um, is you know, determined by its uh, cellular makeup. And so when you look at neuron number, you also see a really huge expansion in neuron number in humans. Um, and, and in particular, if you look at the cerebral cortex, um, our brains have around double the number of neurons compared with other apes. And double doesn't actually sound like a lot, but actually at the end of the day, what we're talking about is an increase of around 7 billion in humans compared with chimpanzee and gorilla. And so the other striking thing to, that, that I recently realized actually is that these numbers, is that basically when you compare these numbers, you actually realize that um, a gorilla or a chimpanzee brain is actually closer in terms of neuron number to a mouse than it is to a human just to kind of illustrate the huge difference in total neuron number that we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> and so we're really interested in understanding where this expansion comes from. And we're focusing on early stages of development, um, trying to look at uh, the generation of this uh, greatly expanded neuron number. And so because we're interested in a human specific question, we need a human model system. And since we can't go in vivo for these types of studies, we've turned to in vitro studies. And so the question is, you know, how do you end up with developing brain tissue? It's such a complex tissue 
um, in a dish. And actually, of course, the embryo does it just fine. So the idea that we've had is sort of, can we mimic what's happening in an embryo um, as closely as possible in a dish? Obviously, it's still in a dish, so there's going to be differences, but uh, can we get as close as possible? So before I tell you about the method, I have to give you a little bit of background on um, just sort of the early embryonic events that, are, that we're sort of modeling here. So the embryo obviously begins as a fertilized egg. You have the formation of the blastocyst and the inner cell mass um, is what will uh, give rise to the entire body. So these cells are pluripotent stem cells. And they undergo gastrulation and form the three germ layers and the uh, a part of the ectoderm, the midline of the ectoderm will actually fold up. Uh, so it will, it's actually the neuroectoderm and it will actually fold up and close and form the neural tube. And then the more um, rostral region of the neural tube is gonna expand out uh, quite dramatically and generate the um, telencephalon uh, with the cortex, the cerebral cortex being the more um, dorsal part of that. And so uh, to mimic this process, we basically uh, just wanted to allow the cells to follow their own intrinsic developmental programs as much as possible. So in all of the methods or all of the work that I'm gonna show you today, we um, almost entirely, so I think pretty much every project I'm gonna tell you about except for one little tiny part, uh, we are not using extrinsic manipulations like small molecules to drive identity, but rather allowing the cells to spontaneously take on the identities that we're interested in, and then essentially um, minimizing the overgrowth of other identities. So how do we do this? We basically to use polypotent stem cells, lift them off, re-aggregate the cells, and then form these, uh, these aggregates called embryo bodies. And when we do this, the cells start to spontaneously differentiate. They exit pluripotency and start to take on different germ layer identities. And then when we place them in a very minimal media, basically the non-neural uh, mesoderm and endoderm down here, those tissues uh, require a more rich uh, serum or, or serum replacement based media in order to grow and, and expand. But if we remove those components, then we're able to maintain the neural ectoderm very nicely while the other uh, germ layers essentially die off or, or don't really expand to the same extent. And what you end up with is something that it's, it's not a clean, it's not a perfectly clean neuroectoderm, but what you get is a really beautiful organized neuroectoderm around the outside. And when you place those in a droplet of matrix gel, that provides this stimulation with extracellular matrix that uh, causes a reformation or a reorganization of this, uh, of this neuroectoderm so that they form these neural tube-like buds that actually have a sort of a lumen just like what you see in the actual neural tube. And then um, each one of those buds can grow out and get to be quite large when we then grow them under some sort of agitating culture to allow for better nutrient and oxygen supply. And so at, uh, uh, at the moment, I should say, when we originally published this, we were using spinning bioreactors, but now we use, in my lab, we use really just uh, orbital shakers. So and then more recently, we've also begun incorporating a bit of bioengineering. We're using things like uh, fibrous microscaffolds to help shape those embryo bodies so that they have a larger surface area. And as I mentioned, neuroectoderm is around the surface. So by doing that, we end up with more neuroectoderm and less of the mesoderm and endoderm. And just by making that small sort of topological change to the embryo body, we end up with very nice organoids that have a um, forebrain identity. So what's the forebrain? So we're talking about this part uh, here. Uh, including the ventral ganglionic eminences here. So you've got the dorsal cortex, cerebral cortex here, the choroid plexus, and the ganglionic eminences here. And so what they form are these large, eventually they form these really nice large um, outgrowths here, these lobes. And each one of these lobes has a fluid filled uh, cavity that you can actually inject here um, with a blue dye so you can see that better. And so basically we, so when we when we look at these, we um, these are we look at these like each one of these is sort of a, a little mini kind of telencephalic vesicle. So of course in the actual brain you'd have one telencephalic vesicle that splits into the two hemispheres. In our organoids we have a lot of these telencephalic vesicles. But um, when but we can sort of focus on each one of these. Uh, lobes as a unit, and that's actually how we analyze them, and, and you'll see how we 
um, do our various um, phenotypic analyses. So we kind of look at each one of these lobes uh, in, uh, as a unit, as a telencephalic unit. And in this case, you can see all of these are actually making very nice cerebral cortex. And so it doesn't really look like a brain, I know, but when you compare with in vivo, you start to see some similarities. So you can see these nice big fluid filled ventricles, just like in vivo. You can see how large they can actually get to be as well. So we can scale bars here. And you can see that they form a really nice cytoarchitecture, um, just like the developing cortex that you'd see um, in vivo. And so you have a nice ventricular zone, subventricular zone, an intermediate zone, and a cortical plate. And you have neurons out here in the cortical plate, and the progenitors down here in the VZ and the SVZ. So, and then recently we've also built upon this method to take it in a few different directions. Um, a very talented PhD student in my lab, Stefano Giandomenico, established a method to culture the organize of the air liquid interface. And this allows for um, improved survival uh, of the organoid as a whole, but also the neurons within uh, surviving for at least a year and beyond. And then these cultures end up forming very nice long range connections with um, large bundles similar to tracts of the brain. And many of these extend within and connect far regions of the organoid, but also we see bundles that seem to leave the organoid entirely. And we found that these, what we call sort of escaping tracts could actually innervate an extrinsic target tissue. So here we've placed an explant mouse tissue of, of developing mouse spinal cord with, um, with adjacent muscle actually. And you can see nicely how these um, human bundles are innervating the mouse tissue. And then when we stimulate, let's see if this actually plays, yeah. And then so when we stimulate the human organoid, we can actually see nice contractions of the mouse muscle showing that these are actually functional connections. And so then also uh, recently, um, Laura Pellegrini, who's an excellent postdoc in the lab, uh, developed a new model to study the choroid plexus of the brain, which is the region within the ventricles that generates cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, here she was able to show that these organoids displayed the structure and morphology that you would actually see in the, in the choroid plexus in, of the developing human fetal brain. And then she also found that these organoids over time form these really large fluid filled sacs suggesting potentially some sort of CSF-like fluid. And of course, choroid plexus being the CSF producing tissue, we got very excited about that. So she collected the fluid and sent it for mass spec and compared it with in vivo. And we saw a really nice overlap of the proteins detected in the organoid fluid compared with actual CSF fluid. And not only that, she could also show that um, they formed a very selective barrier even to very small molecules, L-dopa and dopamine here. Um, just like the actual barrier that protects the brain. And then recently, we also became interested in the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, because of the increasing reports of neurological symptoms in these patients. And we actually found that certain cells in our choroid plexus organoids showed high levels of ACE2, which is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. And so we decided to test whether the choroid plexus could potentially be susceptible to this virus. And so we treated um, choroid plexus organoids with the virus and found that these cells do seem to be easily infected. You can see plenty of viral protein here within the cells. And also uh, we found that cell-cell junctions uh, seem to break down upon infection. Here you can see the nice junctions marked by Claudin-5 compared with um, the infection. And this uh, actually led to actual uh, functional breakdown of the barrier where we could see um, leakage of protein across, across the barrier. And so um, just quickly summarizing this story, we found that, um, uh, so we think this might be important for um, some of the neurological symptoms of COVID-19, because it suggests that if the virus could get into, you know, can get into the bloodstream, which is probably very rare, but if it does get into the bloodstream, then it would have very easy access to the choroid plexus. Um, because actually the, the um, capillaries here within the choroid plexus are very leaky because the endothelial cells are fenestrated. And so that means the virus could easily access these cells, and then that could lead to um, infection and barrier breakdown. And once this barrier begins to break down, then you'd start to have leakage of inflammatory molecules and immune cells crossing into the brain where they, where they really don't belong. So we think this might be um, important for some of the um, neuroinflammatory-like symptoms that some patients are experiencing. Okay, so that was a quick sort of like you know, run through some of the latest work that we've published, but now I wanna talk about um, two stories in particular. One was published this year and one is hopefully gonna come out soon, uh, but both of them are looking at brain size. 
So for the first part. So before I jump into what we did here on this evolutionary project, um, I need to give, give you a bit more background on what we know so far about early stages of brain development. And of course, I should emphasize, you know, animal models have given us so much insight and we're only really able to do some of these, you know, look at, have some of these hypotheses that we have based on the animal work. So it's really set the stage for all of this. Um, and so uh, what I'm showing you here are a series of sagittal sections of the developing human brain over time. And you can see that it starts out as an elongated neural tube, like I, like I showed you in the beginning, with the more um, anterior or rostral portion uh, expanding and really ballooning outwards to form the cerebral cortex, which is greatly enlarged in humans, of course. So if you were to zoom in the wall into the wall of the uh, developing cortex during these early stages, you'd see a cytoarchitecture that looks something like this, this very cartoonish view, um, where you initially have a very homogeneous population of neuroepithelial cells, or what I've labeled NECs here. And these make up a very, so initially it's very sort of thin cortical wall. And these are, these are epithelial cells. So they have typical apigobasal polarity and they're tightly associated with one another with cell-cell junctions. And at this stage, the cells are just dividing symmetrically to expand their numbers. But then at a certain point, they change their behavior. They become known as radioglial cells or RGCs, and they begin to divide asymmetrically and start to make neurons, as well as other intermediate cell populations like intermediate progenitors and outer or basal radial glia. And then those cells can also generate neurons. And so depending on where you are in development, the expansion of the cortex, the sort of the mode of expansion is very different. So early on, the expansion is in this tangential um, uh, uh, axis, right? Um, and the apical ventricular surface is expanding uh, during these, these symmetric, with these symmetric proliferative um, uh, divisions. But then uh, later, when you have the switch to, to radioglial stem cells, then you, you also have a switch in the mode of expansion to a radial, into the radial dimension, where now the ventricular space is no longer expanding, and instead the cortical wall begins to thicken. And so we were interested in understanding when human-specific differences, and I mean human-specific meaning human compared with our closest living relatives, the other apes, might arise during this process and whether uh, any of these sort of decision points uh, of these founder stem cells that set up the cortex might be different in humans. So we can't really analyze fetal or embryonic samples of our closest living relatives, the other apes, but we can at least look at postmortem adult samples and we can start, up, start to come up with some hypotheses about what might be unique to humans. So here I'm showing you some um, uh, coronal sections of the adult chimpanzee and human brain. And you can see that around two to three fold uh, increase in size in humans. And then um, if we look at the uh, gray matter, so the gray matter here is around the outside. It's made up of all the neuron and glial cell bodies, which of course comes from those stem cells I just talked about. So the gray matter is nicely organized into six uh, cortical layers. And this is true in all mammals. Um, and what's nice is that these layers actually reflect a temporal progression of events during development. So when radioglial stem cells begin to make neurons, they make them in a very specific order with the deep layer neurons being generated first, followed by more superficial layer neurons. So that means we can actually look at the cortical layers of the adult brain and we can start to make certain predictions about what might have been different during development. So if we do this across rodents and primates, we find that overall cortical thickness is greatly expanded in humans and other apes compared with mice. But in particular, the primate um, superficial layer neurons are more expanded than the deeper layers compared with rodents. You can see this here. You see layer six and layer five actually don't look that much different. But then you start to see big differences in layer four, layers three, and two. Right, and here in mouse layer two and three are really sort of just one layer. Somehow I've lost the other eye on that three there. Anyway, this is layer two, three. <laughs> so, um, so this difference between, um, between the apes and the, and the, and the rodents um, fits very well with recent evidence uh, pointing to an expansion of later born progenitors called outer or basal radioglia, which become, they become more prominent a bit later in cortical development and are 
very likely responsible for this uh, huge expansion in the more superficial layer neurons. But now if you look for human specific differences, so meaning differences between humans and other apes, you know, you do, you do see a slight uh, increase in overall cortical thickness. It depends a bit on where you are in the cortex, but it's certainly not enough to explain the twofold increase in neuron number and increase in overall cortical size. And actually, if you take the layers and you, and you take them as a ratio of the total thickness here, then you actually don't see any difference between humans and other apes, meaning that there isn't a specific increase in certain layers, but rather a general increase in all neuron layers and types over the entire surface of the cortex. So that would suggest that something must be different earlier, earlier before any of these neurons are even made so that it can evenly affect all those neuron types, including those more deep layer neurons. So those can be increased as well across the surface of the brain. Okay, so that's the setup. Now let me show you the data. So basically to investigate this, we decided to take advantage of the unique capabilities of organoids because now we can actually make organoids from these um, uh, primate species where we have no access to fetal material. So the approach was simple, basically just generate organoids from different species uh, and see, what, see what's different. So we went into this very sort of open-minded, we just figured we'll make organoids and see what's different. I wanna point out as well, a number of really great studies that have recently come out. Um, to, which have also been aimed at looking at differences in brain development between humans and other primates also using organoids. And there's especially been a lot of uh, beautiful single cell RNA-seq uh, that's uncovered unique differences in rates of neurogenesis and maturation. But so far, um, all of the studies have focused on stages after the onset of neurogenesis, and so they would miss any differences that might happen before those first neurons are made. They also haven't really looked at the, at the tissue itself and sort of the tissue architecture. And so we wanted to do that using our organoids. And so this was a uh, work carried out by Sylvia Benito Kuczynski, who's a very talented PhD student. She's just left the lab. She's now going on to a postdoc with Lawrence Studer. Uh, keep an eye out for her. She's going to be doing great things in the future, I'm sure. And she spent a really long time working on various uh, ape IPS cells. We have several different cell lines. These are just a few of the organoids that I'm showing you here, just a couple representative ones. But she spent a long time making sure that she was making organoids that were really comparable across the different cell lines that had the same identity, the same sort of um, architecture, and could be could be really compared so that we're so that we're properly comparing um, uh, similar uh, you know identities and, and, and structures. And um, what Sylvia noticed was that um, no matter you know how much she optimized the protocol for these different uh, uh, ape lines she could never get them to be as big as the human ones. So they were always a little bit smaller. And actually we quantified this at, at earlier stages and found that they were always about uh, two times smaller in size. So then we wanted to identify when the size difference first appears, appeared. And we found that initially when the organoids are not really even organoids yet, but just you know, embryo bodies. Um, and we've just sort of started neural induction. Um, they're just beginning to take on that neural identity. The human and the other ape uh, um, uh, tissues here have the same sort of size and shape. But after five days of neural induction, when the organoids have begun to take on a neural identity, and they're now expanding these telencephalic-like sort of outgrowths, we start to see a difference in overall size. And it's very, very subtle at this stage, but we wanted to really capture the very beginning of this size difference. But hopefully you can see it a bit better at uh, in these um, whole mount stains here, where um, we're staining for SOX2, which is a marker for um, these radial glial or, well, these, the progen these very, very early uh, founder stem cells, let's call them at this point. Um, and also the apical uh, surface markers are one. So now you can see that the human organoids at this stage, this is at five days in neural induction, they show uh, larger uh, lobes basically than, than you see in the other, uh, in the other species. And then Sylvia uh, worked with a mathematician to, to come up with a pipeline to trace out those lumens and measure their um, surface area. And when she quantified them, they she found that the human organoids were um, significantly larger than the other apes overall. So then the question was, where might this size difference be coming from? So we go back to our sort of understanding of cortical development and these two very different modes of expansion. And based on what we know so far, we figured that the most likely explanation for the larger human tissues uh, 
is that maybe this switch has already occurred in the non-human ape tissues, but it hasn't yet happened in the, in the human. And that's why the lumens are expanding more in the human, but they've stopped expanding in the ape. So to look at that, we looked for uh, those more differentiated daughter cells that should be present if the cells had already switched to radioglial uh, stem cells and had started making neurons. So we stain for the intermediate progenitors here uh, marked by TBR2 and for neurons marked by DCX or double cortin. But we actually didn't see an earlier presence of these cells um, in the non-human ape at this time point when this tissue size is already different. So meaning that both species are still uh, not yet radioglial stem cells. They're still neuroepithelial cells. Um, but we do see, of course, these, these cells are arising later on. So, that, so the idea that it's an earlier switch uh, to neurogenic radioglia doesn't seem to be an explanation for the difference. So then we went back to the drawing board and started wondering if maybe the reason tissue shape is different actually comes back to something related to cell shape. Um, so maybe, you know, in both species, the tissue is still made up of symmetrically expanding neuroepithelial cells, but maybe their shapes are different, and that's leading to a difference in tissue architecture. And so to test this, Sylvia did a sparse labeling using a virus carrying a GFP, and she found that early on, before any differences in tissue shape, we also don't see any differences in cell shape. But at the onset of the difference in tissue shape and size, we found a clear difference in cell shape with the ape neuroepithelial cells um, already showing a, a more elongated and constricted cell shape, whereas the human ones still appear quite you know, columnar with very large sort of fat apical processes. And you can see this uh, even better here on these images where we've segmented out individual cells. And you can see that at the day, at day five, the um, ape neuroepithelial cell is already quite elongated and, and constricted, whereas the human doesn't seem to do that until later. And we can also quantify this by now staining again for zone one, but now we're looking at sort of an on FOSS view. So we can actually see the surface of the, uh, of the ventricle, so the apical surface. And we can trace out the, the zone one of each one of those um, apical processes and quantify the surface area of, of these honeycomb-like processes. And so when we do this over time, we see that in both species, the apical contacts are clearly constricting, but this process is more slow in human compared with the non-human ape. So then we started thinking about, well, what does cell shape really mean for, this, for the behavior of these cells? And we thought that maybe it's impacting things like nuclear positioning. If they have more constricted apical processes, are the nuclei then positioned more basally? So we looked at that just by staining, just by looking at um, DAPI and staining for the apical marker again here and measuring um, uh, where these uh, nuclei were along the apical basal uh, axis. And we found that the gorilla uh, organoids showed uh, more basal localization of their nuclei. And that's really uh, interesting because it has important implications for this stereotypical behavior of these cells called interkinetic nuclear migration, where they move their nucleus in time with the cell cycle so that they always undergo mitosis at the apical surface and then S phase at the basal side. So this got us thinking about the implications of cell shape differences and cell cycle. So we tried a lot of live imaging and had a hard time here because these tissues are very, very finicky. These neuroepithelial cells, they die very easily. But then um, Kate McDowell started her lab uh, right down the hall, right during the pandemic actually. Um, and she built, uh, so when she was a postdoc, she developed this beautiful SimView adaptive light sheet microscope that she's used to image developing mouse embryos very nicely. And so when she started her lab here, she built one here as well, and it's right down the hall. So it was really easy for us to put some organoids on it. So again, we did some sparse labeling with virus and then watched uh, individual cells within these organoids. And we were able to measure things like, you know, cell shape and um, uh, and in particular, what we were most interested in, of course, was cell cycle. So we just tracked individual cells and measured how long did it take them from one division to the next. So when we did this during the stage when cell shape is different, we found a clear difference in cell cycle with the, um, the ape showing a longer cell cycle than the human. And the difference wasn't huge. It's only about three hours longer. But if we do some simple growth curve modeling, 
of the effect of this difference, you know, if this difference is present during the time when cell shape is different, what effect would that have on progenitor number and then on neuron number? And the data then actually predicts an increase in final neuron, neuron number of just over, of just under twofold increase in human, which is very remarkably similar to the difference in cortical neuron number uh, in actual, you know, the actual human cortex compared with uh, ape. So um, to sort of wrap up this first part, um, we've identified a really interesting mechanism involving a cell shape transition where these neuroepithelial cells are becoming more elongated in both species, but it's happening earlier um, in the ape, so later in the human. And um, what's really also interesting is that this change in cell shape is happening first in this process before other events like changes in cell fate. So they're not yet making neurons. They're still just symmetrically dividing. They haven't changed their fate. And also in terms of identity, they're, they're not expressing radial glial markers yet. They're, they're not expressing the typical sort of um, uh, glial markers that you would see in, in radial glial. So this seems to be a precursor to this neurogenic switch. And so we've called this phase transitioning neuroepithelial, the transitioning neuroepithelial stage. And then what we've shown is that this delay is associated with a shorter cell cycle in human uh, that allows these founder, founder stem cell this founder stem cell pool to proliferate more and increase if the pool of progenitors so that once they switch to making neurons, there are just more of them in the human and that enables an increase in overall neuron number that would affect all the subsequent neuron types that are being generated and probably also glia as well, of course, as we would expect. <clears throat> okay, so I think I'm probably just in the interest of time going to skip past the sort of molecular mechanism side of this because it is published and just kind of jump straight to the end of this where we've identified a key factor in this process and that is Z2. So you can check out the paper if you want more information, but basically we found a very nice, um, through RNA-seq we found Z2 seems to be coming on earlier at this stage in the ape, and it seems to be helping drive this change in cell shape through its regulation of cell-cell junctions, um, as well as actin, actually. And it's uh, doing this through its um, uh, uh, activity on the SMADs. And so we could actually show that we can, um, we can sort of uh, apeize the human organoids and even humanize the uh, gorilla organoids simply by playing around with this uh, pathway. Okay, so I want to move to the last uh, part here and make sure I have enough time for that. So, um, so this project was started by a very talented postdoc in my lab, Eva Kilava. And what Eva became interested in is this really striking difference in males versus females with regard to susceptibility to neurological and mental health disorders, like autism spectrum disorder, which is more prevalent in males. So this got us wondering whether, um, maybe there could be differences in the brain um, already that lead to this different, these differences in susceptibility. And while male-female differences are, is an area of uh, really intense debate and there's a lot of sort of controversial and sometimes not very well executed studies, one difference has been confirmed time and time again and that's overall brain size. So on average, males have overall larger brain sizes and increased volume of gray matter meaning you know, neuron and glial cell bodies compared with females. And um, of course, I should stress here that it, this is a, on a population level, on an individual level, you can't tell. There's just, there's a lot of overlap here, but nonetheless, it does suggest there might be something interesting going on here and that uh, there may be on, a, on average, uh, a difference uh, in overall brain size um, in males versus females. Um, and also, there was a study uh, that showed that uh, when you look at gene expression differences um, in the brain, you find that uh, the biggest differences are actually during fetal development. So suggesting that maybe some of these differences are arising during development, which you might expect because of course, uh, brain size and neuron number is gonna be uh, heavily impacted by fetal neurogenic uh, events. So there are essentially two major factors that could contribute to these brain differences. One is hormones, so testosterone and estrogen, and the other is the sex chromosomal makeup, so XX or XY. 
And normally it's very difficult to disentangle these two because normally if you're you know, working in mice, for example, you, know, you have a male embryo that has the XY uh, components in the brain, but it's also got testes producing the hormones. It's very difficult to disentangle them. Um, but that's where, of course, you know, organoids give us that power. And um, the other uh, interesting aspect I want to point out is the, the, um, the, um, what we know about uh, hormones. So we know that there is actually a very uh, strong fetal surge of testosterone in male fetuses. So this is in, in human fetuses. And actually the levels of testosterone in the male fetal plasma during the surge reach uh, levels close to the kinds of levels you see during the pubertal surge. So really quite uh, high amounts of testosterone circulating in the fetal um, blood at this time. But we don't know how that's impacting brain development, at least in humans. And so um, we thought that organoids might provide a nice way to, to test these, uh, to sort of disentangle these, these two factors and also give us the human context. And so what Eva did was to generate organoids from male and female cell lines and then test different hormones. And so uh, E is estrogen here, T is testosterone, and DHT is dihydrotestosterone, which is a form of testosterone that can't be converted to estrogen. And this is really interesting because um, mouse studies have shown that um, the masculinizing effects of testosterone in the mouse brain uh, in, in uh, um, in forming those what are called sexually dimorphic, those differences in the sexually dimorphic nuclei is actually through the action of estrogen, which is converted from testosterone. So by using dihydrotestosterone, we're also able to test that uh, mode of action in the organoids as well. And then, um, uh, so Eva performed um, treatments of organoids during the stages when they're most similar to the stage when that fetal testosterone surge would be happening. So morphologically, we're going we're looking for, we're looking at these stages, uh, morphologically they match sort of those stages. So, and then Eva looked at a broad range of different cellular behaviors and readouts, um, looking at uh, different progenitor population and neurons. And basically, long story short, she found a really striking effect on neural progenitors, specifically uh, that upon treatment with androgens, so the testosterone and the dihydrotestosterone here, the organoids exhibited increased numbers of intermediate progenitors here marked by CDR2. And this is quantified here. And you can also see that we saw no differences between the male and female cells um, with regard to these uh, neurogenic events. And they both responded the same to the hormones. So then to uh, determine where this increase was coming from, we did a lineage tracing experiment where we clonally labeled individual radial glial stem cells using a GFP carry carrying virus. So we just sort of inject this into those ventricles. And then upon treatment with the androgen here, we saw individual, we saw that individual clones were generally larger. And this is also quantified here. It's not a really huge increase, but we're not expecting something really big here because the difference in brain size anyway between males and females is not gigantic. But another way we wanted to test this as well in, in sort of a more robust way really was to use a construct expressing a constitutively active form of the androgen receptor. So this allows us to also test whether the activity is through the androgen receptor as we would expect. Um, and so here we stand for the proliferation marker Ki67 and found that, um, so, and found that basically cells expressing the construct were maintained in a more proliferative state. So essentially we're seeing an increase in radial glial progenitor proliferation upon activation of androgen signaling. And that seems to be leading to the increased uh, numbers of their daughter cells. And so then we wanted to get at a mechanism. And so we performed RNA-seq on treated and control organoids and identified a number of differentially expressed genes. And when we do geo-term analysis, we pull out a lot of terms related to chromatin binding and specifically HDAC activity. And this is really interesting because chromatin activity and sort of epigenetics in general is sort of uh, an area of, of active research in autism. And also there was a, a recent paper showing that the phenotype of, a, of an autism mouse model, this Shank 3 deficient mouse model, could be rescued by HDAC inhibition. So uh, of course, given the, sex, the differential sex susceptibility of autism, uh, this got us particularly excited. And so we wanted to see we're going to look at um, how androgen signaling and HDAC activity might be interacting in this context. So we performed experiments with the HDAC inhibitor valproic acid, 
It's a very broad inhibitor. We also did experiments with more specific inhibitors of, of individual um, HDACs and saw the same thing. And basically, what we saw was an off, the opposite phenotype of androgen treatment with a decrease in the number of TBR2 positive intermediate progenitors. And this could be rescued by applying uh, DHT, suggesting that the two pathways are actually acting together on neural progenitor fate. We also looked at human phenotype ontology terms, which revealed uh, a number of terms associated with head and brain size, like microcephaly and ma macrocephaly that you see there. And of course, as I mentioned, um, overall brain size is the most striking difference. So that you know, got us thinking about um, whether we could also look at differences in neuron number in this context as well and see whether that was actually increased. And we found uh, an increase we did indeed find an increase in these excitatory neurons here marked by SATV2 and quantified here. So, but the cortex also contains, of course, very important inhibitory neurons and inhibitory neurons are actually generated from a different set of progenitors. So they're generated in the ventral forebrain. So we wanted to look at those as well. And so we generated organoids where we actually ventralized them. So we, in this case, we actually did put on um, a sonic hedgehog agonist in order to get more of the organoid to take on that ventral identity and allow us to look at the effect of androgens on those um, progenitors. And so now we're staining for DLX2, which is kind of is marking the intermediate progenitors of the ventral cortex, or the, sorry, the ventral forebrain here. <clears throat> but now when we treat with uh, androgen, we actually don't see an increase in those progenitors. And if anything, we see a slight decrease. So we're not seeing the same thing in, this, in, this, uh, in the inhibitory neurogenic context. And so uh, there's a lot more data here that I don't have time to show you, but basically we've identified, a, a, I think, a pretty striking effect of androgens on specifically excitatory uh, neurogenesis that increases their proliferation and then <clears throat> increases their neurogenic potential. But this doesn't seem to be the case for inhibitory neurogenesis. And this is really interesting because um, there has been the suggestion that perhaps in autism, there's an imbalance in excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And it's been sort of long wondered why there's this kind of female protective effect. It seems like females need a greater genetic mutational load in order to show autism phenotypes. But why that is has been unclear. And so our idea, our idea here is that maybe androgens are acting on this balance and help, helping tip it just a little bit uh, because they're increasing excitatory but not inhibitory neurogenesis. And so then on top of that, if a male fetus then has certain other um, genetic mutations, then that might push it over, over the uh, sort of over the boundary. Um, whereas in a female, you would need more of those kind of genetic mutations in order to push it all the way. Um, so I want to thank, obviously, the people who did the work that I showed you here today. I think I highlighted uh, the key people throughout, but I also want to make sure I thank, in particular, Magda Sutcliffe, our lab manager, who contributed to all the projects that I showed you. Um, and I also want to thank our amazing collaborators and my funding. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, Madeline, thanks for excellent talk. Okay. So if you have any questions, you can ask directly or leave at the chat box, okay? So any, any question from audience or student, postdoc trainees? Okay, while you are maybe the uh, writing, I could start with the question first. So Mendel, I, I think it's a very interesting that androgen actually increased the uh, uh, intermediate progenitor kind of uh, uh, and also the activity of the HDAC, but how about the estrogen? Do you see any kind of a female yeah. hormone? Yeah. That's a really good question. We didn't see an effect of estrogen um, on these stages, but in work that we haven't published yet, and to be honest, it's a bit sort of hanging there because we're not sure what to do with it because Eva's actually left the lab now. Um, oh. uh, she did do some experiments on later stages and we have some preliminary data that looks like estrogen might have effects on um, neurite outgrowth, um, which I think is very interesting, um, especially given some of the other data that's out there. Again, it's a bit controversial because there is so much overlap between males and females, but there is some data suggesting that white matter tract morphology and connectivity is different between males and females. 
And so I think um, maybe the estrogen is, is acting in that aspect. So, but that needs more work. It's very preliminary right now. Okay, sounds good, thank you. And, okay, so there is a one question from Lei. Uh, so the question is, the stem cell you, the stem cell you use, are they from people, I mean, the IPSC or what is the source of the uh, stem yeah, cell? Good question. Yeah, yeah, no, very good question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, specify. Um, so <clears throat> all, let's see. So the, 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 for the uh, male, female differences side of things, or the, the, the sex steroid hormone project, we were just using um, ES cells. Mm -hmm. So we're just using male and female ES cell lines. Um, for the um, evolution project, we have to use IPS cells for ape because there are no ES I... cells. Um, with uh, the human there, we, we had uh, both IPS and ES cells to compare with the ape. Right, right, right. Okay. So I have another question. May, oh, the... may I ask a question? Uh, sure, Angelic. Uh, hi, nice talk. So, I was thinking, have you ever been able to make uh, stem cells from, let's say, Turner syndrome or, or syndrome or Kleinfelter, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. XXY or XO or... Uh, yeah. This would be a good way to... Test this, yeah. 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 Yes. So um, actually, this is something that I'm hoping Eva will do. Uh, <laughs> so sh she did actually make um, IPS cells from... Uh, XXY, and then we got a hold of some XO um, cells as well. So we have pluripotent stem cells for both of those. And uh, she's sort of at that, she's kind of trying to decide what she wants to do in the future. But if she starts her own lab, I think that will be something that she will definitely look at. My focus is coming back to the evolution side of things, but right. we have the cells, so they're ready to be used, yeah. Okay, thank you. And there is a question from Dominica Kao. So thanks, Madeline. Uh, wonder if there is a difference in inhibitory or excitatory neuron proliferation rate in the context of human brain expansion. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, so, so in our um, evolutionary work, we've been focusing on such early stages, it's before they're even neurogenic. Um, I think the next step will be to look at that. And there are, like I say, there's a number of studies now that have been comparing and looking at those later stages, but I don't think they've looked really at inhibitory neurogenesis mm -hmm. really at all, even though the data is probably in there because in a lot of those cases, I think there are some inhibitory neural progenitors, but it would be very interesting, I think, to, to compare that for sure. So I don't know yet, but yeah. Okay, thank you. And there's a question from Matteo. So very interesting talk. When you see this increase in intermediate progenitor due to androgens, do you see any reduction in the number of ventricular radial glia, suggesting that the maybe androgens are pushing radial glia cells to specify yeah. intermediate progenitors? Yeah, so I didn't have the time to really get into the precise mechanism there, but what we think is happening is that basically, you know, each time one of these radial glial cells is dividing, it, it, so normally at the stages that we're looking at here, so we're looking at between 35 uh, and 52 days, normally at this stage, these cells are pretty much exclusively dividing asymmetrically. Mm -hmm. So they're generating one cell that's an intermediate progenitor, and then the other cell is staying as a radial glia in order to self-renew and keep the population. What we're finding with the androgens is they seem to be acting primarily on the radial glial cells themselves. And what they're doing is they're, they're, they're just sort of um, increasing the probability that the cell will instead divide symmetrically and make two more radial glia. And what we see is like androgen receptor itself, for example, we see differences in its expression. We see, um, you know, it's not homogeneously expressed in all the radial glia, and it's also differing based on the stage of the cell cycle as well. So what we think is happening there is you, you can sort of, if the cell is, a, is, a, is receptive, it's expressing androgen receptor, it receives androgen, it then divides symmetrically, but then the daughter cells may or may not express it at that moment. And when they divide, 
then they might divide asymmetrically again and make intermediate progenitors. But now you can see how instead of just making one intermediate, well, basically if it goes through two divisions under control conditions, you get two intermediate progenitors. Now, you know, you're, you've gone through one symmetric division, so you're doubling the potential there, um, the eventual potential. But it's very sort of, it's fluctuating. So it's not, it's not like a, you know, and we also, we also did some, a little bit of mathematical modeling here as well. And based on our observations, um, we found a difference in total neuron number that we could, pred a predicted difference of 9.5%. And the difference between male and female is about 10%. So it fits really nicely actually. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of just slightly tipping the likelihood that the radioglial cells would divide symmetrically and expand at, at any given division, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And okay, any other questions? So I have a very simple question. So is it androgen or estrogen? Are they also produced in the brain or they're from the like a uh, gonad? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, primarily they're generated within the gonad, and actually really in, in the female context, there's not really going to be that much estrogen either, actually. I mean, this is sort of the, this is why sort of female is kind of like the default. Um, so when you have, you know, androgen response, you know, like androgen receptor um, deficient individuals, they, they may be XY, but they would, they'll be born uh, looking so with external genitalia of, of, of a female, right? But they won't have functioning um, ovaries. So the, um, the, the um, secondary sexual characteristics are, I think, is, is primarily being determined by the presence or absence of the testes and their production of androgens. Mm. That said, you know, there, I think what's interesting here is that, you know, I mean, we know that um, you know, when you, when you think of like um, sex chromosomes, that's dimorphic, it's like XX or XY. But then we are not dimorphic, you know, when the brain particularly is not dimorphic, there's a huge amount of overlap. So I think what's interesting here is that, I mean, I think our, that our, this hormone idea would, would explain that very nicely because it would suggest that different individuals could have different levels of hormones. There's also some, other areas that might contribute to some degree. So the adrenal gland in female fetuses can also produce some degree of androgens, actually. The placenta also can produce some level of androgens, much lower than a fetus in a male, but nonetheless, you know. And then there's like environmental aspects as well. You know, there could be androgenic compounds that get introduced into the mother's diet, for example. So I think it, this, um, this would fit very well with the fact that there's a huge overlap because you can quickly see how levels of androgens could be modified and could be in a very large, very broad range from individual to individual. Okay, uh, there are more questions actually from Ridvan. So to have an in vitro in vivo link in a normal physiological context is androgen estrogen started to be produced in the body at the development stage, you checked the yeah. back in, yeah. That's a really good question. That was that was one of the first things we kind of tried to make sure we we modeled as closely as we could. And we, we went based on morphological hallmarks. Mm -hmm. So the uh, fetal surge in a male fetus is starting around um, eight weeks. So, no, I think it starts, no, sorry. It's peak, peaks, I think, at eight weeks. And our... Um, organoids sort of like around uh, 35 to 50 days morphologically if you look at the cortex and you compare it with fetal cortex you know across different time points you can see a very nice match in terms of morphology uh, to the eight eight or nine week um, cortex by about that stage so basically we're starting it at the very beginning we're trying to to match the very beginning of that surge and then keep it on through the peak. And then we're actually analyzing at the peak. Okay. 
All right, sounds good. Uh, uh, last question. Alexandro Judon, uh, thank you. And maybe you have mentioned it, but is the organoid ventricular structure necessary to see the effect of the androgen or the 2D MPC culture should be enough? That's a fantastic question. I actually don't know. We didn't actually test in a 2D system. That's a very good question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have no answer for you. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank All you. right. Thank you, Madeline. Okay. I'll let you give a, a thank you for the. Thank, for the, you. For the talk. thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Very nice to see some of you today as well. All right. All right. So I will see you maybe in the future in person. Okay. Yes. Right. Hopefully. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All Bye, right. Everyone. Take care. Yeah. Bye. -bye.